from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Sowing hope. And most farmers, this is our passion. This is what we do. It's who we are. We check in on how planting is going in Texas as we get our first crop progress report of the season. Trying to find a new way around. We've got to get this up and running. How crews are working to move ship traffic in and out of the closed port of Baltimore. As more cases of avian flu are reported in dairy cattle, investigators look for a cause. But perhaps there's some other um, transmission that's happening. In the latest on this developing story right now on Ag Day. Ag Day, presented by Pioneer. What's next happens when the testing grounds meet the proving grounds. Pioneer. What's next happens here. Good morning, I'm Michelle Rock coming to you from our studios in Kansas City. Clinton is on assignment. Concern is growing after additional cases of highly pathogenic avian flu and dairy cattle are confirmed in more states. The latest cases are now reported in Idaho, Michigan, and New Mexico, bringing the state total to five. Right now, researchers are trying to determine how it is spreading, and they may have found a clue. APHIS continues their epidemiology investigation as the illness spreads. Initially, the agency thought HPAI was only transferred through wild birds, but now they're including the possibility of cow-to-cow -cow or farm-to-farm -farm spread. However, officials with the National Milk Producers Federation tell me the definition of cow-to-cow -cow spread is important. While APHIS has not ruled out transfer through the air, one theory is it could be mechanically spread, say from milker to milker. We're not sure that it's actually aerosolization. That doesn't seem to be the be the mechanism, mechanism, although we perhaps can't rule it out yet. Um, but but perhaps there's some other um, transmission that's happening. And in, in one term that's been utilized is you know some sort of mechanical transmission. And you know are there are there other pathways that would be perhaps untraditional for a flu, but uh, maybe the way that it is being uh, transferred from cow to cow. Uh, here in this uh, outbreak. This may be good news because the spread would be easier to control through increased biosecurity measures in dairy operations. If it's not through aeros aerosolization, it should be easier to control. And um, uh, the dairy industry on our website, uh, nmpf.org, uh, USDA on their website, and, and several of the states uh, have biosecurity resources available for uh, farmers to look at uh, what they are doing today for biosecurity and uh, um, uh, making improvements on their biosecurity to help mitigate the risk uh, of this occurring on their farm. So far, the illness is not having an appreciable impact on the nation's milk supply, but the illness impacts about 10% of the affected herd and lowers milk production, which can take about 30 to 40 days to be regained. And he says they're not concerned about a possible export ban. In terms of exports, I think the important thing is that um, the uh, U.S. milk supply is safe. The Food and Drug Administration um, uh, uh, has indicated that because of what we do through the Grade A pasteurized milk ordinance, starting at the farm side and then what happens in processing, that the supply is safe. The impact on interstate movement of cows is determined by each state's veterinarian. He stresses HPAI has not caused any deaths and USDA is not requiring clinically infected animals to be culled. He says cows do recover, but some farms may decide to cull due to the loss in milk production. Again, that meat is safe. We started hearing rumors about possible cases of avian flu last week in Michigan in dairy animals, so why does it seem to take so long to get confirmation? Experts we spoke to say it takes about five days to get test results back in order to confirm HPAI. Those samples will be you know, delivered to the diagnostic labs usually on the same day. Uh, they get those samples set up and run, usually results off the next day if they, if they have a reportable disease or, or a, a, a questionable disease that they'll, they'll send those on to NVSL for, for confirmation. So obviously influenza A is a, a, a you know, a reportable disease in, in, in chickens and, and poultry, uh, so they're going to forward that on to NVSL for confirmation. APHIS says federal agencies are also working with state and industry partners to encourage farmers and vets to report cattle illnesses quickly so they can monitor potential additional cases and help minimize the impact and risk to farmers, farm workers, consumers, as well as other animals. 
Happening right now, crews are working to open an alternate channel near the collapsed Key Bridge in Maryland. The Joint Command Center says this would open the flow of commercially essential traffic to the Port of Baltimore. As Cole Higgins reports, the port is central for the movement of auto and agriculture equipment. Demolition crews back at the site of the collapsed Francis Scott Key Bridge Monday removing debris as part of the complicated and extensive cleanup process that could help open up a temporary channel. This will be for vessels that don't draw as much water, so about 11 feet, as work goes on at the same time to clear the main channel. That's 50 feet, and that's the channel we have to clear to get more container ships back into the port. Uh, of Baltimore. The Port of Baltimore, one of the busiest in the U.S., opening an alternate channel that will allow commercially essential vessels to reach the port, a major step forward in recovery for the community. It is a critical, critical economic hub. We've got to get this up and running. Larry DeSantis believes he was one of the last people to drive over the bridge before a massive container ship ran into it, heading to work that morning, crossing the bridge likely just seconds before it came down. It took a while for it to really sink in. And, you know, because of the initial shock of it, but then more and more people are calling me to see if I'm alive, you know, because they knew I traveled that time in the morning over the bridge. DeSantis emotional when thinking of the six construction workers killed in the incident. I feel sorry for those workers. I really do. I mean, they're doing their job, but, you know, they lost their lives. So it's, it's, it's hard to... You know, I, you know, I rode right by him. You know, I saw all of them. You know, just a minute before they probably died. Reporting for Ag Day, I'm Cole Higgins. And another incident involving a bridge over the weekend. A family out fishing on the Arkansas River in Oklahoma capturing the moment a barge hit a bridge. The bridge was near the Kerlock and Dam. U.S. 59 had to be shut down for the investigation and inspection of the bridge. Crews from the Grand River Dam Authority and the Oklahoma Department of Transportation assisted. Fortunately, no one was injured and the road was reopened after a few hours. The case of the crash is still under investigation. All state parks in Big Sur, California are closed as this part of the cliff gave way on the state's famous Highway 1. Crews are working to fix the road that crumbled into the ocean over the weekend. Officials say a landslide caused the slip out. It's unclear what caused part of the road to collapse, but the area has seen heavy rain. And the threat of rain and potentially severe thunderstorms is now tracking to the west. Meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht has more. Yeah, we'll start right there as we're back into an active pattern. And as we talked about last week, a kind of the seven to eight day period with the jet stream, these waves coming through, uh, kicking up the severe weather potential. And it kind of goes hand in hand with warmer temperatures deeper into spring, the same kind of energy your chance of severe weather really starts to increase. Where that red is painted, that, that starts into central southern Indiana, back through Illinois, and then into Texas and Oklahoma and Missouri. That's where we have the uh, possibility of several severe storms, uh, strong storms uh, producing not only a uh, possibility of some tornadoes, but large hail and strong winds, a severe weather risk. Now that low pressure system and the cold front that's causing this is going to be moving off to the east. So we've got a blank slate uh, for our severe storm risk coming up on Wednesday. Notice severe storm risk, not snow risk. We'll talk more about that uh, coming up in just a little bit. And check this out, the snow water equivalence map in California and some great news there. All that heavy, wet snow is really adding to the snowpack. Recent storms have brought the statewide snow water equivalent up to 105% as of April 1st, and that number could continue to rise. I'll have more on your forecast coming up. And we got our first crop progress report of the season from USDA on Monday. It reports right now 2% of the nation's corn crop is planted. That's 1% ahead of average. Texas leading the way with more than 57% of the crop planted. And 3% of the cotton crop is also planted. That's 1% behind the five-year average. And some better news about this year's winter wheat crop. 56% of the crop is rated good to excellent. Last year at this time, it was only 28% good to excellent. The president of China, Xi Jinping, expressing optimism last week about the future of U.S.-China trade relations, including the potential resolution to a continued trade dispute. 
the comments made during a meeting with CEOs of American companies in Beijing. President Xi emphasizing the importance of cooperation with regards to trade, agriculture, climate, and artificial intelligence. The remarks aimed at bolstering foreign investment in China, which has seen recent decline. Despite past expressions of goodwill between Xi and President Biden, improving relations are yet to materialize. Corn futures gave back some of last week's gains, but it was also a tough day for other grains. I'll dive into it in markets coming up. And later, spring planting is well underway in Texas. We'll ride along as farmers there celebrate the start of another season in the country. Starting this week, most fast food workers in California will now be paid $20 an hour. Democrats in the California state legislature passing a law last year. The law was supported by the Trade Association representing fast food franchise owners. But since it passed, many franchise owners have pushed back about the impact the law is having on them. Due to slowing sales and higher expenses, some businesses report having to lay people off. The law applies to restaurants offering limited or no table service and those that are part of a national chain with at least 60 establishments nationwide. It's reported many of the more than 500,000 people who work in fast food restaurants are not teenagers, but instead adults working to support their families. Welcome to Markets Now. Dave Chatterton with Strategic Farm Marketing joining us. And Dave, uh, down day in grains and cattle futures, it felt pretty risk off in the grains where we seeing report hangover. I know the dollar was higher, but what combined to pressure that market? Yeah, Michelle, I think the dust settling on the report that we had Thursday, of course, we went through the three-day weekend here and, you know, a little correction of what we had on Friday's rally and particularly in the feed grains here, uh, or particularly in the corn and, and the row crops, I should say. But we're in a situation where, you know, the market felt a little bit heavy late in the day. We did come back some on the, on the corn and had a, had a decent close. But I think when we, traders look ahead here, we're looking at a situation where those missing acres have really been the debate. The USDA dropped 6.3 million acres on Thursday out of the principal crops so that they were not going to get planted. And of course, we had a corn number that came in, a corn acreage number that came in below expectations. But as we look historically, we don't have to look any further than last year to find a quarterly report, or excuse me, the reports on the, the planning intentions from March to June, where we saw a 2 million acre increase in corn from March to June. So there is historical precedent for us to claw a few of those acres back as we go forward. So I think that definitely is is on the traders' minds here as we look forward today. It's one of the things that we, you know, that we kind of were left scratching our heads about after the, the data came out on Thursday. Yeah. We also had a big down day and imploded in the cattle market. And we continue to see high path avian influenza, not only in dairy cattle, but now maybe even in humans. And so that kind of tanked that market. Yeah, it was a really interesting day in the last talk, particularly in the cattle. You know, we came off, you know, this morning a little bit lower. We worked our way all the way back, traded, you know, slightly in the green, kind of fell back a little bit at midday. And then there was a story that hit late in the session from the Washington Post talking about a person in Texas who had contracted the avian flu from contact with dairy cattle. And that sent the market into a little bit of a panic Had a bunch of selling and a big flush late in the day. Now, details on that still lacking. The you know, the authorities are still telling us that the risk to humans is low. The only symptoms in this particular individual were that he had, I guess he had, you know, red and, and watery eyes. But, right. um, you know, the market is obviously sensitive to this topic, Michelle, and something that we're going to yeah. have to be dealing with, you know, um, in, the, in the next several weeks here and kind of kind of vetting out. Well, hopefully cooler heads will prevail. Thanks for joining us, Dave Chatterton with Strategic Farm Marketing. We'll have more on Dave. I mentioned it earlier, we looked at the severe weather risk. Now, got to look at the snowfall estimate. The higher terrain, obviously, you're going to get some snow coming down with some moisture. But more importantly, with this next low pressure system, the cold air and the, of course, water in the atmosphere, I got the possibility of nearly six to eight inches of snowfall in and across portions of Wisconsin. This is through Tuesday night at 11 p.m. I'll hit the button Wednesday as the system starts to move to the south. Pick up more snow over Wisconsin, even into uh, northern Illinois and uh, Minnesota and Iowa as it 
starts to exit. This will start to work down to the south and then up to the northeast, where again, you're starting to see that cold air and the snow possibility uh, up into uh, upstate New York as well as the northeast. Again, that's a snowfall estimate. Talked about it earlier as well. Some snow in the higher terrain back out here to the west. So first, it's the severe weather uh, possibility coming up on Tuesday and then snow moving through. Is April yeah, as we go into our Wednesday. The jet stream looks something like this, and anytime we get stuck in this seven to eight day pattern, what you want to try and find uh, are those U's, those troughs. That's that added energy we've talked about in and across the United States to go from just uh, thunderstorms to severe thunderstorms. So this is a jet stream on Tuesday, and you see the cold front, if we connect these U's right here, cold front's going to extend back down like this, and it's right along that boundary where we surge the moisture in from the south, and we get a twisting in the atmosphere as we go up in height. It's called uh, some uh, shear, and that is where we get severe weather potential. Big bowling ball moving across the United States Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. A ridge tries to develop, and this is not what we want to see going into next Monday, and that's eclipse date in and across the United States. This could bring some cloud cover uh, through a large portion of the United States. Start off Pine Hills, California, sunny, high around 65 degrees, low of 37. Pine Hills, Florida, mostly cloudy, high of 88, low of 71. Pine Hills, Texas, sunny, high of 77, low of 48. Coming up, the good news, bad news in the latest milk production report. And later, we're off to Texas as farmers plant seeds of hope into the ground in the country. Milk production grew in February, but cow numbers are down. The latest report from USDA shows production was up 2.4%. However, on a per day basis, production was actually down 1.1%. Milk cows totaled 9.3 million head. That's 10,000 more than in January, but down 89,000 compared to a year ago. Several states showed a steep decline, including New Mexico, Texas, Idaho, Oregon, and Minnesota, while South Dakota led the way with gains. Dan Bossi of Ag Resource Company doesn't think heifer replacement numbers are going to change anytime soon, keeping cow numbers tight. Lower milk prices have once again triggered payments under the Dairy Margin Coverage Program. While the all milk price in February increased by 50 cents and food costs were lower, it still triggered a national average margin payment of $9.44 per hundredweight. Under Tier 1 of the program, that means payments of six cents per hundredweight for producers with coverage at $9.50. Now, at the end of last month, the March DMC was forecasted to be $9.97 per hundredweight, which may not trigger any payments. There's still time, though, as well to sign up for DMC coverage. Sign up ends on April 29th. Well, there's nothing quite like it, getting those first seeds of the season in the ground. Coming up, we head to Texas, where planters have been rolling for the last few weeks now in the country. As you saw earlier in the newscast, planters have been rolling in Texas. The Texas Farm Bureau caught up with some producers who are hoping for a good year and a bountiful future. Most farmers will tell you, seeing the seed come out of the ground, the beginning of that process it is what really gets you excited, gives you hope for the, for the whole year. My name is Richard Beyer. We grow row crops, corn, cotton, milo. We have a few beef cattle. It's my wife and I, along with our three girls. I grew up working with my dad on a rice farm. He grew rice for several years. Then after college, I came home and started farming on my own, uh, mostly row crops. It's challenging, like I mentioned before, but it's also gratifying. For me, I get to work outside. And while there's many similarities every year, each year is different, working through the whole process, getting to the end of every year. And the hope is that we're gonna have a big yield at the end. Uh, we, we all want to ring the bell every year, so to speak. We really need to have a good yield. There's so much that we don't control, whether it's weather, markets, inflation, things like that. We don't have control over that, so we're yield dependent whenever it comes down to it. With this one planter, we can do about 200 acres a day. We usually take five to seven days to plant our crops. So with corn, I would say within a week's time, we'll have all our corn planted in the ground. Then we'll switch to our milo crop and it's about the same. And then we'll start with cotton. I'm sure if you talk to other farmers, they'll say it gets in your blood. And I think that everybody has something that, that they have a passion for and 
most farmers, this is our passion. This is what we do. It's who we are. And I honestly can't think that I, I would ever do anything else. For me, this is just who I am and it, it's who my family is and it's, it's what we do. Our thanks to the Texas Farm Bureau for that story. That's all the time we have for this morning. Thanks for watching. From all of us here at Ag Day, I'm Michelle Ruff. Have yourself a great day.